Yay, we are live. How are you, Teresa? Hi, everybody. Hey, everyone. Hi, everybody. Let's see, we have already some comment. Simon is here. So guys, while we wait for everybody else to, to join, why don't you... Oh, I'm echoing, sorry guys. So where are you from guys? Where are you joining us today or tonight? I mean, a rainy Barcelona, as well as you, Gino and Loic, right? Indeed. Well, Loic is uh, I like, Actually, in France, you can maybe hear the, like the... I have just the bell tower of the church just in front of me, um, in, uh, in the Alps, in a small village. Oh, I, I can see a few friends. Hi, Renan. Hi, Kim. Brazil, Teresa. Barcelona, from Germany, but joining from Barcelona, London, Argentina. Where are you, Teresa, actually? Uh, in Seattle? I am in Bend, Oregon. So it's a oh. small mountain resort town right in the middle of Oregon on the west coast of the U.S. Fantastic. Yeah. People from Mexico. Quite an international edition. Chile. Nice. We have already 40 people in the live stream. I will say let's start with the classic intro so we can leave as much time as possible for Teresa. Sorry, I was mute. Um, I was about to say, sorry, not, not actually not that so classic. That's that's a new intro. So uh, for the ones who have been here and uh, following us for a long time, you will see that's a, a new and shorter intro. Um, so yeah, hey everyone, uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, we hope you are all safe um, and, and healthy in these, uh, in these times. Um, so yeah, as Gino was saying, uh, I won't spend too much time on the intro because we have like a super interesting talk uh so uh, yeah let's crack on with the um uh with the the new intro so product tank you you already know it's uh the biggest uh community of product people in the world um we are uh, in all these cities you can see it's more than 200 uh and uh we are product people and uh we we do events for product people So apart from product tank that you know, there is also Mind the Product that uh, some of you, of course, know. Um, we have conferences, uh, but also um, a big community on, on the blog, which is uh, super interesting. I really recommend you to, uh, to check it. And um, yeah, so that, that's just like a, a big network of, of product people uh, available to you. Next one, please. So. Uh, what is also very important is that uh, anyone can be a speaker at Product Tank. So um, there are many, many product people uh, with a lot of experiences that can benefit other product people and would be super interesting. So really, really don't hesitate to contact us uh, if you can think about anything that you want to share with the community. Um, also, uh, so right now we are all digital, but at some point uh, when the situation allows, uh, we will get back to um, like, face-to-face -face product tank also, which is, um, I mean, very good for this, uh, this networking that we were doing before. Um, so if you want to host uh, a product tank or sponsor one, just contact us. You can also write for mindtheproduct.com, the blog. Uh, it's super interesting. If you don't know it, I really recommend you to check it. Uh, so many like great articles there. You will learn a ton about a lot of different great product people. But you can also write it, um, I mean, produce some content, which is super cool. And finally, uh, you can become a member. You probably 
you maybe know it's not, uh, already or not, but uh, if you go to mindoproject.com join slash join, you can we have like membership uh, where you can uh, get like some free courses, ask me anything with some product people and uh, a ton of uh, other services uh, to create, uh, I mean, to be part of this community, which is super interesting. And of course, you can also just uh, get, I mean, go through the, uh, get the, the, the free membership uh, and you also have a, a lot of things available. Um, and of course, uh, join the, the Project Tongue Barcelona. I will let Gino uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Um, thank you, Lloyd. Um, it's actually quite difficult. I've never been so excited introducing the speaker to Product Tank Barcelona because, uh, you know, Teresa is part of my personal holy trinity of product management. Uh, now I have, I have the chance to introduce Teresa. I hope to complete my holy trinity soon, uh, but I don't think she needs any introduction to you guys. I think most of you are here already because you know her as coach, as a speaker, and as, of course, as a great author. Uh, I want to personally uh, thank you, Teresa, for um, your Opportunity Solution 3 framework. Uh, in my career is something that helped me a lot, both in helping my teams, coaching them in getting better at discovery and, and trying to understand the problem domain before jumping to the solution. But mostly, even more important for me, has been useful to uh, educate stakeholders, other execs, in, an in, in analyzing the problem scope before jumping to solution as well. Uh, tonight, Teresa is guiding us through some concepts around continuous product discovery from her new book, for her new book, Continuous Discovery Habits. Uh, many teams see discovery in a linear way, kind of working by projects, where every step is followed by another, from research to stability testing to A-B test, everything works in a linear way. But it's not the optimal way to work. And uh, Teresa is going to show us how to make discovery an integral part of our uh, product management process. Um, without further ado, I will leave the stage for Teresa. Just one last reminder, as we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, uh, please post your question in the comment section. We will review them and we will ask the most interesting one to Teresa at the end of this uh, uh, of her presentation. Thank you, and I hand it over to you, Teresa. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much for that very nice introduction. Um, so welcome to the what and why of continuous discovery. Um, I'm Teresa Torres, and I like to share at the beginning of my talk that I've worked with teams all over the world in a lot of different contexts, some as small as a two-person founding team, others as big as multinational companies with hundreds of thousands of employees in a wide variety of industries. And the reason why I like to share that is because I know what it's like to sit in the audience and to hear a talk and get excited about methods and then to walk away thinking that might work for Amazon and Google and Facebook, but it's never gonna work in my organization. So I wanna start with odds are I've worked with a team just like yours and the tactics and the framework that I'm gonna introduce um, probably ha can work in your environment. So I wanna encourage you to think about what you might be able to take away. And we're gonna talk a lot about taking a continuous improvement mindset to the stuff that we're talking about. So you don't have to walk away trying to be perfect tomorrow, but how do we make next week a little bit better than last week um, so that we can all make progress on our continuous discovery journey. All right, so let's start with what do we mean by discovery? Um, if you've ever seen me speak before or read any of my blog posts, you've probably seen this slide. We often talk about discovery in contrast to delivery, where discovery simply represents all the work we're doing to make decisions about what to build. And then delivery is the work that we're doing to build, ship, and maintain a production quality product. Now, discovery has become pretty trendy over the last five to 10 years. And that's because a lot of companies under um, overemphasize delivery and underemphasize discovery. And we're starting to see companies elevate these to be on equal footing. Um, but a lot of us learn discovery methods from a project mindset. And this is, this is because of the way it grew up in the industry. Um, a lot of design agencies advocated for discovery. And because they were external, they advocated for project-based discovery. Right, so what's project-based discovery? We start with, a pro we kick off a new project or initiative. If we're lucky, we interview a bunch of users or customers at the beginning of the project. We synthesize it in a research deck. 
Um, and then if we remember to throughout the project, we refer to that deck to help us make decisions. And then at the end of the project, when we're done with the design work, we validate it with usability research. And when we're done with the delivery, we validate it with the A-B test. There's nothing wrong with project-based discovery. In fact, it's better than not including your customers in the discovery process. But what we're seeing is digital teams are starting to recognize that our products are never done. We can always iterate, we can always improve. This is really what's driving the continuous improvement sort of revolution. And so as a result, we need to start to think about as we start to continuously deliver value, how do we pair that with the continuous discovery framework? And so what I'm gonna start with is just a really clear definition of continuous discovery. So I define it as at minimum weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product where they're conducting small research activities in pursuit of a desired product outcome. Now I know there's a lot to this definition, so we're gonna break it down line by line. And I wanna start with this first line of just talking about this cadence of why do, should we engage with customers every week? For many of you, that may, that may sound like a really aggressive cadence. So I wanna get into the why with this. So as product people, and by product people, I mean product managers, designers, software engineers, user researchers, even content marketers, um, any but data analysts, scrum masters, anybody who's working on a digital product. We're making product decisions every day. Some of them are big strategic decisions, like which opportunity should we go after, which customers should we serve. Others are more everyday decisions like, what do we label this button? How do we expose this feature in the interface? How should this workflow work? How should the underlying data, what should the data underlying data model support? Most of us know that we should do some research for these big strategic decisions, but we forget that these everyday decisions can also benefit from customer input. And there's a really important reason why. So product people, as we work on our products, we start to develop a depth of expertise about our product. So we know where everything lives in the interface. We know what's possible in the product. We know how the underlying data model works. We become experts in our product in a way that our customers never can be, right? Our customers are never gonna know our product as well as we do. And the problem here is there's a bias that we fall prey to called the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge is a bias that basically says, we can no longer remember what it was like to not have the expert knowledge that we've developed. And so the challenge here is even if we're well intended, if we're not engaging with customers regularly, we're gonna start making decisions from our own expert point of view because we forget what it's like to not have that expertise. So there's a really easy way to avoid this and that's simply to engage with our customers more often. And I really recommend that you try to get to a weekly cadence. That's so that as you make your daily decisions, if you engage with customers weekly, you're getting a regular reminder that you think about your product differently from your customers. And for most of us, when we see that gap between how we think about it and how our customers think about it, most of us are motivated to overcome that gap. So by engaging with customers on a regular basis, it's gonna help us overcome the curse of knowledge. It's also gonna help us with another mindset shift that I think is critical to good discovery. And that's that a lot of us, because we grew up in a project world, we've adopted a validation mindset. We do all the design work and then we validate it with usability research. We do all the delivery and then we validate it with A-B testing. Those methods are needed. We do need to do validation research. The challenge is if we only do validation research, we're only getting feedback late in the process, it's really hard to act on customer feedback. It's really expensive to make changes after we've built everything. It takes way more time and energy to make design changes after we've designed everything. So if we talk to customers on a weekly basis, we're gonna get feedback much earlier in the process. We're gonna get feedback on half-baked ideas. We're gonna get feedback on pencil sketches. And this is gonna help to unlock a co-creation mindset where we're working with customers to choose which problems to solve. We're working with customers from the very beginning so that we can act on much more of their feedback. Now, when I talk about co-creation, inevitably somebody in the audience is thinking of one of two pretty famous quotes. The first is from Steve Jobs, where he talks about, customers don't know what they want until we show it to them. 
And the second is the Henry Ford quote where he allegedly said, if I asked customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So I wanna be really clear here. When I talk about co-creating with customers, I'm not suggesting we go to our customers and say, what do you want? That's not gonna, that's not gonna lead to reliable feedback. You're gonna see in the second half of this talk, we're gonna get more into how do we work with customers in a way to get reliable feedback on what we're doing? And so don't think about this as we're just gonna take this shortcut and say, hey, what do you want? And we're gonna build feature requests. It's not about that. It's about working with customers continuously to understand their world so we can synthesize their experience and expertise about their context with our experience and expertise with technology so that together we're co-creating better products. Okay, so we've tackled this first line, weekly touch points with customers. Let's get into the second line, by the team building the product. So I cannot emphasize this enough. It's not that we have a discovery team that's different from the delivery team. We need the team that's building the product to do their own discovery. And this starts with this idea of a product trio. So a product trio is typically comprised of a product manager, a designer, and a software engineer. Um, and the goal is that this is the team that is leading discovery. So they're not the only people involved in discovery, but they're leading the decision making around what to build. And this is really critical. I wanna contrast this with what we've historically done. Historically, we worked in a waterfall model where the product manager wrote requirements. When they were all done, they were handed off to a designer who did all the design work. And then when that was done, the requirements and the designs were handed off to the engineers who then did the delivery work. What's wrong with this waterfall model? We see a lot of handoffs and context and nuance lost with each handoff, and we see a lot of rework. So let's talk about the problem with handoffs. That maybe the product manager Maybe the product manager is gathering requirements from business stakeholders. Hopefully the business stakeholders are talking to customers. The requirements get handed off to the, engineer, the designers and then they get handed off to the engineers. So now we're seeing engineers as they're making delivery decisions, they're several hops away from the customer. It's like a game of telephone. We're losing context, we're losing nuances. Engineers don't have the, the um, background knowledge, the customer knowledge, to make good delivery decisions. And this is why we see a lot of projects end up off track. The other thing we see with each of these handoffs is we see a ton of rework, right? So the product manager writes requirements, they get sent to the designers. Designers run into issues. They run into the design constraints. Maybe they can't um, meet a requirement. So they go back to the product manager, they rewrite requirements, the design finally gets finished. It gets handed off to the engineers and the engineers run into technical constraints. Maybe the underlying data model can't support what the requirements or the design as written or designed, or maybe something's gonna take 10 times as long as expected, and we don't have time to build it the way that the requirements spec it out. And so what do we do? We rewrite the requirements, we redo the design work, and this is why most projects end up um, under, under scoped, over budget, um, and late. We don't wanna do this. We're learning from experience that initiatives go better. We do better product work when these three roles collaborate from the beginning. So we're getting, it's a little bit counterintuitive because we feel like we want our engineers to write code and our designers to design, but we actually save downstream work, downstream time by having these roles collaborate from the very beginning. Now these aren't the only three people on your team. You probably have additional engineers and depending on your DevOps strategy, you might still have QA folks or release managers on your team. Depending on how you interface with the rest of the business, you might have a data analyst or a product marketing manager or a customer success person or a user researcher or any number of other roles on your team. I'm not trying to exclude roles with this slide. This idea, I realize there are dozens and dozens of roles that contribute to creating digital products. Here's the idea. The trio leads discovery. They, the idea of a trio though can flex based on the roles available to you and the type of decision that you're making. So for example, if you work on a full-time data heavy product, you might actually have a quad where your data analyst is part of that core decision making team. Or you might pull in people for different decisions based on the context. So if you're doing discovery for your go-to-market strategy, you might invite your product marketing manager to be part of just those decisions. 
Here's what we're trading off with the idea of a trio that flexes. The trade-off is between quality of decision-making and speed of decision-making. So quality, we wanna make sure we have the right cross-functional roles in the room to make sure we're leveraging the expertise on our team. But we don't wanna include everybody in every decision because the more people involved, the smaller we're gonna go. So, that, so again, it's quality versus speed. And currently, the industry belief is that the trio is the smallest team that's required to get us good quality. So we don't wanna go smaller than this trio but we might invite other people to help us make better decisions at the cost of speed. Now, this doesn't mean these are the only people doing discovery activities. This is your leadership team that's leading decisions. And because they're driving decisions, we want this team engaging with customers on a weekly basis because it's this team that needs to bridge the gap of the curse of knowledge. Okay, so we've talked about weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product. Let's now get into the second half of this definition. What are we doing when we engage with customers every week? The key is we're gonna conduct small research activities. So we can't take our project-based research activities and try to jam them into a weekly cadence. We'll simply burn ourselves out. So we're gonna change our research methods to a, support a continuous cadence. And we wanna make sure that those methods are in service of driving a desired product outcome. So we're not doing research for research's sake. We're doing research to create business value and customer value. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. So a lot of teams struggle with this. We often pit business value against customer value, and it's really critical that we align these from the beginning. So there's a visual um, that was referenced in the introduction that I like to use to help teams manage this and make sure their research is in service of an outcome. And that's called an opportunity solution tree. And if you've never seen this, we'll walk through how it works. It starts at the top by defining a clear outcome. Now an outcome is a metric. It's a business outcome measures the health of your business and a product metric, a product outcome is a metric that measures how your product supports the health of your business. I wanna contrast this with what we've historically done. Many product teams start with outputs, right? We're asked to deliver a fixed roadmap. What's wrong with this output world? The last 18 to 20 months, the entire world just got a lesson in how ambiguous and uncertain the future is. When we start with a fixed roadmap, we're, ass we're assuming we can predict the future. We're saying, we know what we can build this quarter. We know what we can build six months from now. We know what we should be building at the end of the year. We're recognizing that the world changes too quickly for that to be realistic. Now we're probably hopefully not gonna face a global pandemic all the time in our lives, but we do see new technology disrupt our markets. We, need, we see new competitors enter our space. Even when we release code changes ourselves, it has an impact on what's possible, how our customers behave, how the market behaves. So as we shift from outputs to outcomes, we're starting to acknowledge we can't predict the future. So we have to experiment our way to outputs and so instead of starting with fixed outputs, we're gonna start with what's the business value a team can create. Now this is really important. Your outcome should represent business value. So I'm gonna give you an example of this. I'm gonna use Netflix as my example, not because Netflix sponsors me, I've never worked with them, but because people around the world are broadly familiar with Netflix. So let's imagine that the leaders at Netflix go to a product team and they say, um, a key metric in our business model is subscriber retention. We need you to um, increase subscriber retention. That's a business outcome. The product team now needs to translate that to a product outcome. A product outcome is a behavior that occurs in the product that the product team can directly affect. And so the product team needs a theory of how the product is gonna create business value. And in this case, we might say, we believe that if people watch Netflix more, they'll be more likely to retain. And so we're gonna focus on increasing viewing engagement. So that's a product outcome. It's measuring a behavior in the product. With that in place, that's our outcome that's telling us how we're gonna create business value. We then wanna discover opportunities that might drive that outcome. Opportunities is where we're looking at customer value. So an opportunity represents a customer need, a customer pain point, or a customer desire. And the opportunity space is infinite, 
So we're gonna bound the opportunity space by starting with our business outcome, our business value, and we're gonna look at how do we create customer value that in turn creates business value. So we're aligning two things that at a lot of companies are at odds. We're aligning them so that we're discovering solutions, our outputs, that, that, can, that can both create customer value by addressing a customer opportunity and can create business value by addressing that opportunity in a way that drives that outcome. Okay, so this is our framework that we're gonna use to ensure that our research activities are in service of an outcome and are still customer centric. So let's talk a little bit about how do we do this. It starts at the top of the tree. We have to define a good outcome. And what's key is this needs to be a two-way negotiation between your business leader, your chief product officer, your vice president of product, maybe a, a, a general manager of your business unit and the product trio. And the reason why this is a two-way negotiation is because the, uh, the business leader is communicating business value and the product trio is translating that to an outcome they can measure in the product. With that in place, we're now gonna look at the first small research activity that we're gonna do on a weekly basis. And that's, we're gonna interview to discover opportunities. Now this is really critical. A lot of people think about interviewing as a way to explore solutions. I want you interviewing to uncover customer needs, customer pain points, and customer desires. We're doing this week over week, regardless of where we are in the delivery process. And the reason why is we wanna to ear to the ground, make sure we always have a handle on the opportunity space. When we do this, it means when an external trend like COVID happens, we're able to adapt and react because we're continuously talking to customers, we continuously understand how the opportunity space is shifting. Now, the reason why most teams don't do this is it's actually really hard to find customers to talk to on a regular basis. Recruiting is our biggest barrier to interviewing every week. So what I encourage teams to do as a first step is to automate your recruiting process. Now this is gonna sound magical. The way that it works is you're gonna show up to work on Monday morning and you're already gonna have an interview on your calendar without you having to do a single thing. I'm gonna give you three strategies for how to put this into place. The first is to recruit people while they're using your product or service. So you already have your customer's attention while they're using your product. You can embed in your product, whether through an interstitial like you see here or a pop-up or embedded somewhere within the product flow. You can ask them to schedule an interview. You can use scheduling software so they can just put an interview on your calendar. It's dead simple. Now, if you do this, you're gonna have to treat it like any other product funnel. You're gonna have to experiment and optimize to get it to work. Where do you show the pop-up? What language do you use? How much time do you ask for? What incentive do you offer in exchange? What times do you expose to be available for interviewing? All of these are variables that you will have to optimize. But this strategy works extremely well in B2C contexts and, in, and for recruiting B2B end users. And I will say the vast majority of teams that I work with are optimizing this funnel to, and they're automating their recruiting process so that they don't even have to think about it. Now, if you need to recruit B2B buyers, this next strategy is gonna work for you. You're gonna use your customer facing teams to help you recruit. So that's your sales teams, your account managers, your support teams. And you can go to them each week and say this week, if you're talking to a customer who has this need, pain point, or desire, or who's exhibiting this behavior, go ahead and ask them if they'll do an interview with us and just put it on my calendar. So instead of using your product to recruit interview participants, you're using your customer facing teams. This is a great way to recruit B2B buyers. Now, I'm gonna tell you these first three strategies are gonna work in 98% of cases. There are a small number of cases. Now, everybody thinks they fall into this category. Most likely you do not. But for example, if you work with a teeny tiny total addressable market, I'll give you an example. I worked with a company where their total addressable market was six US-based movie studios. Or if your customers are extremely hard to reach. Now we all think we're all busy. I mean, Fortune 500 CEOs, respiratory ICU physicians and nurses during the height of COVID. Folks that it's not very likely they're gonna volunteer their time. 
What you're gonna need to do is invite them, build long-term engagements with a small number of customers. So a lot of companies have this idea of a customer advisory board. However, I don't want you working with them as a focus group. Instead, invite each member to participate in a monthly interview. If you have three product teams, you'll want 12 customers on your customer advisory board. That means each month, every team has a different customer to talk to, and then next month, you rotate. Every single team that I've worked with has mixed and matched one of these three methods to automate the recruiting process. Once you have a customer in the room, we now need to talk about how do we ask the right questions. The key to interviewing well is to avoid speculation. So if I stick with my Netflix example, I might wanna know what do you like to watch? How do you decide what to watch? Who do you watch with? What device do you watch on? How often do you watch? But I don't wanna ask you these questions directly. Humans, because of the way that our brains work, are terrible at answering direct questions reliably. This is because our cognitive biases interfere. So we're gonna answer qu direct questions from our ideal se selves. We're all optimistic about how much time we have in the future. I'm gonna hear about the documentaries that you watch and not about the reality TV that you watch. I'm gonna, you're gonna forget about all the one-off exceptions that happen on a regular basis. So the key in interviewing well is to collect specific stories about the past. So I'm gonna ask you, tell me about the last time you watched Netflix and in the context of your story, I'm gonna listen for the answers to all those direct questions. What did you watch? Where were you? What device were you on? How did you decide what to watch? And the difference is because we're grounded in a specific story, your answers are gonna be far more reliable. The other advantage of collecting specific stories is it's gonna help us uncover opportunities. So customer needs, pain points and desires are gonna emerge from the stories that we're hearing. We're gonna take all those opportunities across our interviews and map out the opportunity space using this tree structure. The tree structure has two primary advantages. One, it's gonna give you a big picture view of how you can reach your outcome so you can make a strategic decision about where to play. Two, it's gonna help you break down hard, big, hard, intractable opportunities into smaller and smaller, more solvable opportunities. So you're working at the bottom of the opportunity space. Those are the smaller opportunities that are easier to solve. This is what unlocks the continuous cadence. I wanna be clear here, I'm not talking about cherry picking low hanging fruit. We're talking about taking evergreen opportunities like I can't decide if this show is good or not. That's an opportunity that Netflix is gonna work on forever and breaking it up into smaller and smaller pieces. Maybe we hear that one of the ways people decide what to watch is based on the cast. So a sub opportunity might be who's in this show. We can answer that question. That's a much smaller opportunity that we could probably deliver on in the next couple of weeks. So we're gonna choose a target opportunity. And once we have a small target opportunity that we're gonna start working on, we're gonna work with a set of three solutions. Now, most people don't do this. What do we do instead? We hear a customer problem, we jump to our first solution, and we ask, is this idea good or not? The problem with this framing is it's what decision-making researchers call a whether or not decision. When we frame our decisions this way, we fall prey to two different cognitive biases. The first is the escalation of commitment. The more we invest in a single idea, the more we identify with it, the more we fall in love with it. The more we fall in love with an idea, the more we suffer from confirmation bias. Confirmation bias says, we're more likely to notice the evidence that suggests our idea is true, or great, and, and completely overlook the evidence that suggests our idea is flawed. Now I meet a lot of teams that are doing all the re right research activities. They have all of the best intent, but they're working with one idea at a time. And they don't, they, if you ask them, they say, of course I'm comfortable with negative feedback, I'm finding flaws, I'm iterating, I'm doing all the right things. But confirmation bias doesn't say we ignore the negative feedback. It says we don't even notice it. So even if you're doing all the right activities, if you're working with one idea at a time, you're not getting all the value that you could out of those activities. There's a really easy way to fix this. We wanna set up a good compare and contrast decision. So instead of working with one solution at a time, we're gonna work with three and we're gonna say which of these ideas looks most 
promising. Now, this idea is important enough that I'm going to give you a visual to help you remember this. This is Usain Bolt. We're currently in the middle of the Summer Olympics. He was at one point the world's fastest 100 meter runner. If I asked you, is Usain Bolt fast or not? That's a whether or not question. I want to fix it by asking, what are we comparing Usain Bolt to? Is he fast relative to a cheetah? Probably not. Is he fast relative to a Tesla? In the first 100 meters, I would pay to see that race. Is he fast relative to other humans? Absolutely. So what we're seeing on the image on the right is a compare and contrast decision where we have a clear front runner. When we're experimenting, when we're prototyping, when we're testing our solutions, we're looking for this clear of a comparison so that we can have confidence in what we're building. Now, the reason why most teams don't do this is we're still doing project-based research to evaluate our solutions, right? We're building fully functioning working prototypes of the full solution and putting it in front of customers for feedback. We don't have time to do all of the design work for three different ideas before we learn which one is most promising. We're A-B testing. We're building and A-B testing our solutions to understand the impact they might have. We definitely don't have time to build three ideas. No executive is gonna sign off on that. So we need to change our project-based research methods to help us set up a good compare and contrast decision. So I'm gonna walk through an example of how this works. So we're gonna stick with my Netflix example and I want you to imagine that we interviewed a bunch of Netflix customers and they said over and over again, the big gap with Netflix is they, they don't really excel at sports. I wanna watch sports. And since we're in the middle of the Summer Olympics, I'm gonna make this even more specific. Let's say the opportunity is I wanna watch the Olympics. So we know we should work with three solutions. So I'm gonna walk through briefly what these solutions represent. The first, so how might Netflix solve this Olympics problem? The first, here in the United States, the Olympics are broadcast on one of our local public networks, NBC. So maybe Netflix says, we're gonna integrate a live NBC feed into the Netflix interface, right? So then you can watch the Olympics live from within Netflix. That's the first solution. Second solution might be, actually, let's just partner with the Olympic Committee the same way we partner with movie studios and license the Olympic events and embed them directly in the Netflix interface. That's the second solution. The third solution might be, we're Netflix, we're great at TV shows and movies, we don't excel at sports, let's go partner with somebody who is good at sports. So Fubo TV is a streaming service that already integrates local channels like NBC. So if we just bundle a Fubo TV subscription with our Netflix subscription, then people can watch NBC on Fubo and watch the Olympics. Okay, we've got three solutions. Again, we don't wanna do all the design work, we don't wanna do all the delivery work up front. So what's the secret to setting up a good compare and contrast decision? It's taking our ideas and uncovering the underlying assumptions of each idea and rapidly testing those assumptions. Now, this is not a new idea. Eric Ries wrote about it 10 years ago in the Lean Startup. The reason why we don't do it is it's really hard to see our own assumptions. So I'm gonna give you five categories that assumptions fall in, under. You might have seen this Venn diagram before. We talk about products need to be desirable, viable, and feasible. These are some of the same categories that our assumptions fall under. For example, we make desirability assumptions. Why do we think customers will want this? This also includes assumptions we're making about what customers are willing to do to get value from the solution. We make viability assumptions. Why is this good for the business? Why should we do this? If you're an outcome focused team, this is as simple as why do we believe this solution will address our opportunity in a way that will drive our outcome? We also make feasibility assumptions. We believe we can build this. We believe it's possible. We believe it, we have the technology. That's, those are all feasibility assumptions. I'm gonna add two more categories. The first is usability assumptions. We assume that our customers can find it, that they understand it, that they're able to do what we need them to do. And 
we make ethical assumptions. We assume there's no potential harm in building this. This category is where we want to look at the data we're collecting, how we're using it, who we're selling it to, how transparent we're being with our customers about it. Are we storing it safely so we don't suffer from a data breach? This is also where we can look at social equity, um, social justice and inclusivity issues. Things like who are we choosing to serve? Who are we leaving out? Are we being intentional about those decisions so that we don't replicate the social inequities we see in our communities in the products that we're building? Knowing these five categories will help you generate assumptions. You can ask, what desirability assumptions are we making? What usability assumptions are we making? But it's still hard to see our own assumptions. So I'm gonna give you a second strategy. We can use story maps to help us see our assumptions. If you're not familiar with story mapping, it's the yellow part of this slide. Here's what I'm doing. I'm assuming that my solution already exists. So I'm assuming Netflix has already integrated NBC into Netflix. And I'm asking, what does my customer need to do to get value from this solution? So we're starting with the customer has to decide they want to watch the Olympics. They need to choose a streaming service. In this case, they need to choose Netflix. They need to open it up. It needs to be available and working. They need to choose NBC, and then they need to watch whatever's live on NBC. So that yellow boxes are my very simple story map of what my customer needs to do to get value from this solution. The gray boxes I'm asking, what needs to be true in order for my customer to do each of these steps? This is how I'm starting to surface assumptions. So in order for my subscriber to decide they want to watch the Olympics, they need to want to watch sports. They need to be sports fans. That's an assumption that I'm making. In order for them to choose Netflix, they need to know that Netflix has NBC, that the Olympics are on Netflix, right? In order for them to choose NBC, they need to know that the Olympics are broadcast on NBC. We need to be able to partner with NBC. There needs to, in the US, we have all these archaic regional broadcast rights. So even if you get NBC, an event might be blacked out. You may not actually get the event, right? So we need to make sure that we're not subject to a local regional broadcast right. Then in order for you to watch the Olympics, Netflix has to be able to stream that feed reliably. And this is a big deal, right? Because with TV shows and movies, Netflix can buffer them. They're not live. But with sports, sports are live. So if we buffer too much, we run the risk of, is your friend who's watching live through a cable feed going to tell you about an event before you actually get to watch it, right? So story mapping can help you surface assumptions. The value of this is it's quicker to test assumptions than full ideas. And some of our assumptions are shared across all three ideas. So for example, our subscribers want to watch sports is going to show up across all three ideas. If we test that assumption, we're actually testing the under the opportunity. If it turns out not to be true, we can throw the opportunity away and move on to the next one. Other assumptions are going to help us differentiate the three ideas. So for example, in this fourth column, assumptions like we can partner with NBC, that's going to help us differentiate from the assumption we can partner with Fubo TV or we can partner with the Olympic Committee. So some of our assumptions are going to help us compare and contrast our solutions against each other. So this is how we're going to be able to quickly evaluate which solution looks like a clear front runner. So let's talk about how do we test our assumptions. I'm going to give you four quick ways to test a single assumption. So we're going to work with this assumption our subscribers want to watch sports. The first way we can do this is to prototype to simulate a specific moment. So what do I mean by this? I don't have to do a, a full working prototype. I don't even have to prototype the actual interface. I'm prototyping the specific moment in the story map in which it occurred. So I need to simulate the moment when you're deciding what to watch. I can give you a list of options, some TV shows, some movies, some sporting events, and I can simply ask you, what would you like to watch right now? If I have access to an unmoderated testing tool, I can mock this up and launch it and get results in less than a day. This is fast. Okay, second way I can test this assumption is I can do a one question survey. One question surveys live inside your product or service. So you're capturing responses while you already have your customer's attention. So you're not emailing them a, a survey that takes 15 minutes where it's going to take weeks to get responses. 
In this case, we're asking a single question that helps us collect data about our assumption. So we're asking, have you watched a sporting event in the last week? Yes or no. Most companies can collect a lot of data, a lot of responses in just an hour or two. At most, if you're a low traffic site, maybe a day or two. Third way we can test this is the same exact assumption is by asking, are our customers already exhibiting the behavior we would expect to see if this assumption were true? So what data can we draw from? We can look at behavioral analytics. We can look at search queries. We can talk to our sales reps. We can look at support tickets. So in this case, we can ask in the Netflix world, maybe some of our customers are already searching for sports. So we can go look at our search queries and evaluate, do some of our customer, are some of our customers already searching for sports? Okay, these three methods, prototyping a specific moment, not the whole solution. One question surveys, data mining, are gonna cover the vast majority of assumptions that you generate. The fourth type of assumption test is gonna help us with feasibility assumptions in particular. This is where we're gonna do a research spike. A research spike is just a time boxed amount of time where you tell your, in, your engineers to go investigate something. However, in this case, we're starting with a very specific assumption. So let's imagine that we're gonna integrate, we're gonna partner with the Olympic Committee, They're gonna, we're gonna license their games, we're gonna, just like we license movies, and we have a feasibility assumption that the Olympic Committee can give us appropriate metadata to properly display a title, a description, and an image. So we're gonna tell our engineers, we want you to do a one or two day research spike go pull data from their feed or their API and evaluate what percentage of events have appropriate data, how do we need to display it in the interface. So it's a very targeted research spike to test a specific feasibility assumption. Okay, these four assumption test types are gonna help you rapidly test assumptions, helping you evaluate your compare and contrast decision. Now we just covered a lot of ground, so I'm gonna do a, a brief recap. We started at the top by defining a clear outcome. That's, uh, that's defining the business value we're gonna create. We then introduced our first small research activity that we're gonna do week over week. That's interviewing to discover opportunities. We're continuously mapping out and evolving the opportunity space. Once we choose a target opportunity, we're working with a set of three solutions, setting up that good compare and contrast decision and we're using our four assumption test types to quickly test our assumptions so that we can identify a clear front runner. Now we covered a lot of ground. If you wanna learn more about any of these frameworks or methods, I cover them in detail in my book, Continuous Discovery Habits. I wrote this book to be a hands-on practical guide for product trios who wanna put these um, habits into practice. All right, I think we're ready for questions. Oh, are you on mute? Me? Uh, there you go. I, I was mute, right? All this time? Yep. Cool, 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 cool. Sorry. Uh, classic 2021 mistake. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So I was saying that I'm enjoying very much your book. Uh, I, I got a copy here. And thank you so much for, for this lovely uh, talk. Uh, very, very good questions as well. And let's start with, with this one, uh, which is a classic, I think, uh, regarding engineers uh, participating in product discovery. Uh, so uh, FP, this person uh, asked uh, how to get engineers to participate more on the product discovery because she sometimes uh, feels that uh, they are reluctant to participate. Yeah, this is a really common question. In fact, I just recorded a video on on this question. So if you want a more detailed answer, you can find that at producttalk.org. Um, it was my two, uh, two blog posts ago. You can also find it on YouTube, um, but I'll give you the highlights. Here's the thing. We've trained engineers to want to do nothing to do with discovery. 
We've trained them from the IT mindset to be order takers. So we have to untrain them, right? We have to onboard them to discovery. And so we want to start small. We, want, we don't want to say, hey, go conduct a customer interview because most, co most engineers, that would terrify them, right? So the first thing is most engineers want to have an opinion about what to build. So we can connect the dots between if you want to have an opinion about what we're building, you need to participate in discovery. And then from there, you need to think about how do you onboard your engineers the same way you think about onboarding customers. We don't throw them in the deep end, right? We start small and we iterate from there. Um, so if you want more on that, I did record a, d a video that goes in detail on that. Amazing. Yeah, please, please send it and we can uh, deliver it to people on their inboxes. Uh, cool. And somehow connected to that, uh, there's a question from Nadine. Hi, Nadine. How are you? Uh, do you have any ideas on how to best involve PMs, designers, and engineer leads who are not speaking in the same language as the user base? Yeah, this is a really hard question. So we see this a lot with global teams that are supporting multiple markets. Um, I don't have a good answer for you on this other than you need to find a way to get firsthand exposure to your customer. So a, a few things that teams have done is they've brought in a translator so that you're still able to do the interviewing, but it's being translated. That's a little bit tough. You're going to lose some context. You're going to lose some nuance, but it's better than not having firsthand exposure to the customer. You can find people in your markets where at least your language is their second language. Again, there's limitations to that because most people um, have limitations in their second language. Um, maybe you have somebody on your team where their second language is, your, is their first language. That's a little bit better because then you're taking the sort of cognitive hit of having to work in your second language and you're letting your interviewee um, um, participate in their first language. Some teams have like country managers and they leverage people on those teams to help with the translations but you still need firsthand exposure to your customer. That is tricky though, and I will tell you, um, it's possible that teams are finding ways, it's just you have another constraint that you have to work within. Nice, nice. And uh, there's a question from uh, Mara Dumitru. She is asking regarding frequency, I think that you uh, partially covered this topic, but uh, she asks, do you recommend talking to different customers every week, or is there value in talking to the same customers over time? Yeah, the answer to this is both. So with interviewing, we wanna interview for variation because we wanna make sure that the people we're talking to represent the market. So if we only talk to a small number of people, we run the risk of, of what we build not serving all of the market and just serving a subset. However, there is a benefit to talking to the same customers again and again because we get a sense for how their needs change over time. We get a depth of knowledge about their context. So I actually recommend that teams do both. Have some customers that you build deep relationships with and have other customers that you're just talking to a wide variety of so that you're getting the benefit of both of those strategies. Cool. Um, to follow up, let's continue with uh, Nayana's question. She is asking, Aren't desirability and viability assumptions validated already during the customer interviews? She says that in the Netflix example, the customer interviews actually showed, um, sorry, I this one. Uh, in the Netflix example, the customer interviews actually showed customers wanted to watch sports. Okay, can yeah. you see the question there? Yeah. Go. Yes, so kind of, you're right. The, the opportunity I wanna watch sports did come from an interview which is providing some evidence that this is a real need. The challenge is even when we talk about specific instances, it's not like even when we're collecting specific stories and it is a need that is arising, it doesn't mean it's a need that people need a better solution or it's a need that people are willing to pay for. So think about interviewing. Interviewing is generative research. It's giving you opportunity, like it's helping you generate opportunities that you need to explore. Assumption testing is your evaluative research where we're actually testing, is this a big enough need that you actually are willing to consider a different solution from what you have today? And are you willing to pay for it? And that's what we're getting in that, into that viability. So yes, a lot of opportunities will, be, will come from your interviews and that suggests it's something you should work on, 
but there's still more validation we need to do with our assumption testing. And I've worked with plenty of teams where they literally, in fact, I have a case study on this in the book and on, the blog, on my blog, where it was a team that interviewed and they heard this opportunity over and over and over again. And then they, they experimented with three different solutions and across all of their assumption tests, they heard the same thing over and over again, which is, I don't wanna use a third party service to help me with this problem because it distances me from my relationship with the customer. So it was a need, they didn't want somebody else to solve it for them. And that will happen. So we do wanna make sure that we test desirability and viability in our assumption tests. Cool, cool. Um, maybe to introduce this question, uh, it comes to my mind this uh, quote from Bill Gates. He says that, uh, the, the better insights come from our most frustrated users. And Peto Martinez is asking uh, here, he says, one of the biggest pain points I experienced in recruiting was that at least 50% of uh, our customers are angry. So sessions tend to be very tense and not that productive. Is there any way to take the most of them? Yeah. So. First of all, I think Bill Gates' quote is partially true. We do get a lot of insights from our most frustrated customers because that's where we have gaps in how we're serving them. But we also get a ton of insights from our most satisfied customers because they've figured out how our product or service can meet their needs. And we can learn from that as well. So don't just think about your job as fixing your customers' problems you also can learn from the people who are having success. And that's one of the reasons why we talk about opportunities and not just problems. So I wanna start with that. Um, however, when you are interviewing a customer who's really frustrated with your service, I would say spend the first part of the interview letting them just vent. It's gonna build rapport, it's gonna build trust. The golden rule in interviewing is let your interviewee talk about what's most important to them. So give them time and space for that. And, and a lot of what they tell you is going to be unreliable because it's going to be speculation and it's going to be generalizations. Give them airspace for that. Then in the second half of the interview, collect a specific instance and listen for, did those frustrations show up in that specific story? That's what's going to tell you they're real. Now, I have worked with some customers that are so upset that they want to spend the whole hour on their frustrations. So you got to negotiate this at the beginning and say, look, I understand you have some grievances to air. We have 30 minutes together. Can we spend the first 15 minutes on that? And then in the last 15 minutes, I'd like to collect a specific story so that you're agreeing up front that you're not letting sort of their venting to fill the entire time. Nice. There's a, and um, I'm, I'm connected to a company where there's uh, the, the discovery process is run by, let's say a strategy team and there's a product innovation team that just participates to check feasibility and maybe estimate uh, the initiatives. So uh, I wanted to, to understand which are your thoughts around this. Yeah, so this is the result of a project world, right? We believe that business works like an assembly line where we can have a strategy team do all the discovery and then it gets handed off to this feasibility evaluation team and then it's going to get handed off to a delivery team. The challenge with this is each of those handoffs is gonna to lead to a lot of lost context, a lot of lost nuance. Your delivery team is gonna have a whole bunch of questions they don't know how to get answers to because they weren't part of that strategic work. Um, we're also gonna see a lot of rework. So this, what you're describing is a symptom of our old waterfall world. Um, whereas what we're seeing the best companies do and the best teams do is push as much of that sort of strategic work to the team that's building the product so that we don't have those handoffs we don't lose that context we don't have all that rework cool cool um there's a, a question here from uh Peche. he's asking how do we integrate the long-term product strategy with a continuous improvement frame yeah so strategy exists at a few different levels so strategy is going to impact so so your strategic context is going to impact the outcomes you choose Right, so a lot of our outcomes are derived from our business model. Our business model is often set from our strategy, right? You can have two different companies in the same space, two different business models, and as a result, different strategies. So that's the first thing, is how you pick your outcome will be influenced by your company's strategy. The second place strategy comes into play is the opportunities you even choose to put on your, on your um, 
tree and definitely the ones that you choose to prioritize. So you could have a team at Apple and a team at Google, both working in the mobile space. Maybe they have the same outcome of increasing mobile engagement. Maybe they've heard the same opportunities across their interviews, but the Google team is gonna pick a different opportunity to prioritize than the Apple team because they work in different strategic contexts. So your strategic context is some of the factors you'll consider when prioritizing opportunities. Thank you. Um, more questions. Uh, Rina is asking, how do you talk to non-research people about the difference between valuable and trustable uh, feedback and noise? The difference between valuable, trustable feedback and noise. Yeah. Okay. So a, real, a couple of really important concepts in research are this idea of reliability and validity. So validity is um, does it represent reality, right? Did what we learn represent reality? And reliability is if we were to ask them again, would we get the same response? These two concepts in research are really important. Um, most non-researchers have never heard these terms. They don't, I mean, we know the, Engl the words in English, but we don't know what they mean in a research context. I actually don't think we should spend a lot of time teaching people all the research language because they don't really care. I think it's more about how do we arm them with tactics that are simple that they can adopt that just builds those things in. So for example, I can teach you how to interview in a valid and reliable way by telling you to collect specific stories about the past. You don't have to know all the research underpinnings about why that matters. You just need to know that's a best practice and you need to learn how to do it, right? And so I find that especially in a business context, people don't care about the academic stuff. They just wanna know what should I do and quickly why. And so it, we can simplify it by say, collect specific stories. It's gonna make sure that you don't, your people don't, you don't get answers filtered by cognitive biases and you're good. So think about ways to simplify it to make it a, a lot more accessible for people. Nice. Um, related to the product opportunity tree, once you spot like an opportunity, there are several uh, solutions that you can work on, right? And uh, Gunai is asking, how do you pick which solution you will deliver out of the free proposed? This is going to be based on your assumption tests, right? So based on what you're learning from your assumption tests, you're going to learn, do we have a clear front runner? Usually what happens when we start with a set of three solutions is we find problems with all three. The upside of assumption testing is you, when you find a faulty assumption, it's giving you feedback on how to fix or evolve a solution. So what ends up happening is we assumption test, we learn something, that we need to tweak something about our solution, we iterate on it, we do some more assumption testing, we iterate on it. Eventually we, we learn that we have an idea that looks promising, we've removed enough risk. So here's the important idea. We're not proving that our idea will work. We're just doing enough, test, enough testing that we've mitigated enough risk and what's enough will depend on your organizational context and then we're making a bet. So even with assumption testing, you're still making a bet. We're just trying to make better bets. Nice. There's a, one last question before closing. Um, related to this last comment uh, on uh, risk, uh, the, the, the tolerance of risk for each company is different. So um, regarding uh, feasibility risk, uh, in during discovery, what's the kind of uh, estimation activities that you suggest? Like, uh, very broad ones like t-shirt sizing or or maybe going down to to the nitty-gritty yeah so we usually estimate at the beginning beginning of delivery right and the problem with estimating at the beginning of delivery is most of the time at that point we haven't tested our feasibility assumptions if you're not doing continuous discovery and so your estimates are a wild guess and so teams spend a ton of time and energy trying to make them better than wild guesses so then we estimate tasks and we spend full days estimating Here's what I would do instead. Test your feasibility assumptions. When you test your feasibility assumptions, your engineers are, are getting real world practical data on what it will take to build something. And by the time you ask them to estimate a user story, it's no longer a wild guess. You took an unknown future problem and started making it more knowable. And so when you test your feasibility assumptions, you're actually gonna get better estimates. You're never gonna get perfect estimates, right? But you will get better estimates. Guido, you are mute. Yeah. 
cool. Once again, uh, sorry, I, I, I lied uh, and I said that this was going to be the last question. Uh, <laughs> but there's uh, just a question that just appeared from Andu Mo. He, he was a speaker for Product Tank, and I, I think it's quite interesting. Um, what about full time researchers? How and where do they fit into the discovery process? Yeah, so I'll share. I also recorded a video about this question because it's a very common one. So you can find that video on producttalk.org or on the Product Talk channel on YouTube. Again, I'll give you the highlights. There's three primary patterns for how we're using user researchers when companies adopt a continuous discovery model. The first is they can, if you, if you have them as a centralized research team, they can work on longer horizon research projects. Right? So we do have research questions that need project-based research. We just, product teams don't work on a project cadence, so we want product teams doing continuous research. But we still need somebody in the company looking at external trends, looking at customer behavior over time, and so we can use our user researchers to do that longer horizon research. The second pattern we see is that some companies are hiring enough user researchers to embed one in every product trio. That's awesome. So now that means your user researchers can help to make sure your interviewing and your assumption testing is more reliable and more valid. That's great. The third pattern we see is that a lot of companies don't have enough user researchers to embed them on the teams. So they're using user researchers as subject matter experts to advise teams to make sure that teams are doing valid and reliable research. Um, the video goes into much more detail on those three patterns and includes a key anti-pattern of don't let your user researchers become gatekeepers to your customers. Lovely, lovely. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, I'm super happy and there, there's tons of messages from people saying thank you. Uh, there's one like, Teresa, I really admire your enthusiasm about uh, product discovery, keep rocking. So thank you very much for showing us tonight. Ah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun and thanks for all the great questions. Nice. Gino? Thank you, Teresa. And goodbye, everybody, guys. Hope you're enjoying uh, the uh, good season. And hopefully, we'll be meeting again in person sometime soon. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Teresa. Bye, guys. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.